think uh, we're kind of ready. Hello, welcome. This um, said, hi, my name is Alexander Gatsagarias. It's a little bit of a tricky last name, but you kind of get used to it if you grow up with it, I guess. Um, I have a couple of hobbies. I really like bouldering. I really like tabletop games. Think Dungeons and Dragons, Magic the Gathering. And I'm, a, as you might see in the rest of the talk, I'm a huge game nerd. I play a lot of games, a lot of hours wasted in World of Warcraft. Uh, anybody else that likes to play games here? Oh, you guys are at the right talk. So, um, my favorite game ever is Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Uh, amazing game. And right now I again play World of Warcraft because you never quit, you only take uh, breaks. Uh, oh, before I continue, almost forgot. I work at a consultancy, uh, that's the logo on the top left, called J-Driven, small consultancy in the Netherlands. And at the moment I consult as a backend software, uh, software engineer at rootscanner.com in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, that's about it. So um, I'm not affiliated with any of the databases you'll hear today. I'm just a nerd that really likes new shiny stuff. And when ChatGPT came out a couple, day, uh, a couple months ago, actually, um, I was like, okay, that's cool. How can I make this? Well, uh, unfortunately, I would need a couple billions to make it, so I can do that. But I discovered that they underwater use something called a vector database to uh, power their systems. And a lot of AI systems and gen AI systems nowadays actually use a vector database underwater. So then I did what I do best. I tried to make a game using vector databases. Well, that didn't even work out. But I did make a couple cool stuff that I want to show you today and hopefully inspire you to go ahead and use that new, that, this shiny new technology as well in your projects. All right. Unfortunately, before we go right into vector databases, we need to understand something very important here, which are vectors. Um, who here knows what vectors are? Great. Uh, so not everybody, so <laughs> thank God I added these slides. Uh, so mathematically speaking, this is what you'll see when you search a vector. It is uh, something that represents uh, length and direction. Um, and that is a notation you'll see mathematically speaking. Thankfully, we don't really care about the mathematical notation and we can just, you know, come up with our own things here. And we can basically say a vector is an array of numbers. We can see it as an array of numbers. And in this case, when you hear, okay, a vector with uh, two dimensions is, well, you could say it's basically an array of two numbers. If you hear, hey, this vector has three dimensions, it's basically an array of three numbers. If a vector has eight dimensions, it has eight numbers. And dimensions go very high. I've encountered um, uh, 3,000 dimensions. I've encountered uh, projects that use up to like 60,000 dimensions. So a lot of numbers, but basically vectors allow us to organize data very well, and that is why they're used so, um, so much in AI nowadays. So how do we use vectors? Say you have a piece of text like this. Then we, get, uh, we create a vector representation of that piece of text, and that looks like that. So that is a vector representation of uh, the text you see over there. Say you have an image, you can basically do exactly the same. You have an image, and then you create a vector representation of that image. Pretty cool. And nowadays, they do this with everything. Sound, animations, 3D models. They try to vectorize anything and everything. It's not going to take long before they vectorize reality, I tell you. So, and how do they do this vectorization? Through machine learning, neural networks. Uh, like... Ten years ago, this started and became better and better over the years. But this technique is called a vectorization technique, or something you might have heard uh, before. Uh, it's, they use a so-called embedding model. Um, and these embedding models of vectorization techniques are becoming more and more um, uh, well, advanced every single day. It goes very quickly nowadays. Ten years ago, Google released, I think, the first one, Word to Vec and Glove uh, a couple of years later, which basically take text and create a vector representation of this text. Uh, the problem with those is they didn't understand context. So a word with different meanings always had the same vector representation. And then uh, transformer models came out, like BERT, 
and uh, clip models from OpenAI. And actually, at DevOx last year uh, during the keynote is the first time I heard about transformer models. Um, and then I ended up you know, kind of using them, so that's kind of cool. But, uh, and these models actually understand context. They've been trained, these neural networks and have been trained to understand context. So uh, the same word has different representations in different uh, contexts, which is very cool. Unfortunately, these things are very complicated. Uh, and there's no way for me to explain uh, how these uh, embedding modules work and vector databases work within the 50 minutes I have. So we're going to do one of my favorite things. We're going to treat them as a black box. So we're going to put data in, and we're going to get the vectors out. And that's, for now, all we need. All right. So that was, in short, what vectors are and how they are used uh, nowadays. Now let's talk about databases. Anybody knows what a database is? <laughs> um, so what is a vector database? Well, a vector database is a purpose-built database. It has one purpose, on, and it does that very well, to store vectors and allow you to retrieve vectors very, very quickly. So it can store and index high-dimensional uh, high vectors, so up to thousands and thousands of dimensions, or maybe even three. Uh, depends on your use case, of course. Uh, and it's indexing using, so, uh, using nearest neighbor algorithms. Uh, if, you are, uh, if you work with uh, well, graph databases or graph theory or stuff like that, you have probably encountered some nearest neighbor algorithms in the past. Um, and of course, you can store any kind of metadata associated with, this, uh, with your vector objects. So basically, the index is a vector representation of your object. And once you retrieve the object, you still have the properties and everything you need to well, build the application around your data. Pretty cool stuff. If a tech literate, illiterate project manager comes to you, and those do exist, and asks you, hey, the whole internet is talking about vector databases. What is it, and do I want to use it? Then I would probably say, hey, a vector database is a database facilitating Effortless and Swift semantic search on your data. And semantic being the keyword here, because uh, if you just needed effortless and Swift search on your data, you probably would use something like Elasticsearch or maybe your own implementation. But if you really need semantic search, like contextual search, try to understand what your users are trying to search without them actually knowing what they're searching, then vector databases are the way to go. Um, and they are being used pretty much. Um, um, only in AI applications right now, ChatGPT, uh, you name it, uh, MeJourney, DALI, they all kind of use a vector database underwater, but a vector database by itself has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. It doesn't have any um, built-in neural networks or uh, things like that. All it does, it's, it creates a um, vector index for you to be able to search uh, vectors very quickly. That means that you can, if you want, you can use it in your applications that have nothing to do with AI, just for a semantic search. Or, I don't know, if you're making a Minecraft clone, you can just put your whole world in a vector database and query quickly the, uh, the coordinates as you go. Anything and everything. Um, and then when we talk about databases, there's one thing that everybody uh, well, should care about, is how does this thing index my data, right? Uh, and when it comes to vector database, we have ty two types of indexes. We have exact nearest neighbor and proximate nearest neighbor. And these are some of the most popular algorithms, indexing algorithms, these um, this, uh, databases use. So for example, a favorite of mine is linear search. How easy can it get? You, every time a new vector enters the database, you're just going to check against all the vectors in the database and index it accordingly. Amazing. Scales beautifully. Uh, but for example, k, k nearest neighbors is something very popular, right? So you have uh, probably heard that before. And then uh, shout out to Spotify for naming their algori algorithm approximate nearest neighbor, oh yeah, just so they can name it Anoy, pretty cool. And a very uh, a favorite of mine is hierarchical navigable small worlds, which really sounds like you are, have a little game world within your database, which I don't know, I'm a sucker for it. Um, and uh, as you're indexing, you can also uh, index using different distance metrics. So as the database is indexing your vectors as they uh, enter the database, um, they are 
the distance from one vector to other vector objects are always checked and they are indexed accordingly. And that can be done through Euclidean distance or similarity, cosine distance, similarity, Hamming distance, dot product, whatever, whatever, and many more. Uh, some of you might have seen this. Uh, it's quite mathematical and to be honest, if you are working with it, you're probably just going to say, hey, do use, give me Hamming and it works good enough and go. Um, if you don't know what the, the difference between distance and similarity is, a distance basically, if you are asking for the distance, basically you're saying, hey, how close am I to an object? And if you're asking for the, um, of how far am I from the object? And when you're asking for similarity, you're asking how close am I to this object? Now, I know some of you are thinking, okay, this sounds exactly the same. What is this guy saying? Well, uh, the distance, when it's zero, objects are very close to each other. And when the similarity is one, objects are very close to each other. So you could see, see it as inverted. Might be, might be uh, of use later. Um, so distance calculation and indexing always happen within the same vector space. Uh, sounds super cool, vector space, str uh, straight out of st uh, Star Wars. And you can define your vector space by schema or by a table or by object or many, many more. So um, a different uh, table would be a different vector space in a vector database if you're used to a relationship, a relation, a relation, not database, Jesus Christ. So, uh, but why do uh, vectors do this? Vector databases do this is because if you have a vector with 512 dimensions, you don't want to be indexing against other vectors that have 384 dimensions, for example. You always want to make sure that vectors with the same dimensions or dimensionality are indexed against each other or checked against each other. Otherwise, you will get very inaccurate results. Now, if you think about vector spaces, I thought, hey, maybe I can do something with this. So I decided to recreate the vector space of my data sets. All right. So, um, so this is one of the first data sets I'm using. We're entering vector space right now. There we go. And this is a planet, and this is the first uh, one of the objects in the database uh, right now, uh, which is a longbow. Uh, for the ones that don't know what a longbow is, it is very tall. And, um, and if we go further over here, you'll see more objects. So this is a pretty small data set. And uh, you can fly through it. So there we can see a morning star. And there we can see an odachi, which is Japanese weapon. A little bit spoiler for what's coming. Um, a nunchaku. Uh, and as you can see, these vectors are kind of close to each other. Um, oh, and the texture of the planet, by the way, I'm kind of proud of this, is generated through the vector representation of the object in the database. So the texture is always the same per object. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so, but if we take a look here, uh, because I admit this might not be the most uh, user-friendly way of looking at your data. Oh, you guys agree? Oh. So if you look at this uh, small data set here, these are all basically all the points we have in, in our data. Uh, you can see that there are groups being formed, and that is exactly what we want. So these groups, for example, you saw mace and katana, and so these are basically melee weapons or um, weapons that you do uh, short range, uh, that you use short range. Uh, and the fact that they're close to each other means that is that is exactly what we want. Because if we're gonna do a semantic search on, hey, I want a weapon that is short range, we're gonna find one of these. Uh, by the way, I have this vector space for all my data sets, but it takes some time to generate, <laughs> so I'm not going to be showing the rest. But if you want to see it, feel free to come, uh, come over after. So, um, oh, so uh, that means, and that is the beauty of vector databases, is if you do a search in a vector database, you never know what you're getting out. And that is beautiful to me. <laughs> But that, does not mean that it, but that doesn't mean that if you do a search, you won't, you'll get different results. A search will always give you the same result, but you're not sure what that's going to be. So if you have an object in your database that is indeed longbow, and you vectorize that, and then you do a search long space bow, it could be that it finds another object in your database that is closer. So there is no, uh, you cannot be sure what you're getting out of your database. 
There are a lot of vector databases out there, like a lot. Every single day that I'm searching for these things, there are like more popping up. Popping up. There's like this gold rush to create uh, the, new, uh, the next big vector database. The biggest one is Pinecone. Um, OpenAI also uses Pinecone. That is the question I've had a lot of times, which one does, uh, does OpenAI uh, use? Well, Pinecone. But you have Milvis, Qdrand, uh, Chroma, VV8. Uh, well, there's PG Vector for Postgres uh, and more. Um, I think what's interesting for you guys is to your right, are open source, and to your left are closed source. So Redis is open source, but the vector uh, database is part of the, of the um, uh, Redis stacks, which is closed source. And Elasticsearch is like, we are open, but, oh, uh, but we're not open source, but we are open. So kind of a, like a little bit of a, what is happening here. So I have no idea. Um, Another cool differentiated factor is some of them have built-in embedding, built embeddings. So that means when you uh, query the database, they will do the embeddings for you, and some don't. For example, well, what's on the left, like PG Vector and uh, Milvis. And that means that you first have to call OpenAI or Hugging Face or something like that to get the embeddings of your objects and then put them in the database. While others, others uh, uh, support it natively, natively, like TextAI or Qdrand and VV8. Uh, of course, they got to learn uh, earn their money somehow. So they have managed services that you can just you know subscribe to, pay uh, pay as you go, etc., etc., etc. PG Vector doesn't have it by itself, of course, because it's open source. But Supabase has a managed service for PG Vector, and uh, eventually you can all query them, query them through a Python client because Python is the AI language right now. Uh, so a challenge to you to change it to Java or, or Kotlin next year. Uh, who knows? Uh, but a lot of them can also be called through a REST API, uh, like Pinecone, and VV8, and Elasticsearch. Uh, some of them can be called through a CLI, CLI or a JavaScript uh, client. Uh, PG Vector and TextAI you can call through SQL. And then Vespa want to be different, and you can query it using YQL, which stands for Yahoo Querying Language. And to me, that's a kind of kind of weird choice, but huh, you know, you do you. All right, so. Talking about vector databases, that is a little bit how the, how the landscape looks. But I mean, you're all professional Googlers. You're basically being paid to Google around. So if you want to start with vector databases, do your research, see what, uh, what you know um, fits your requirements. All right. So for our demo, I, used, I chose uh, VV8 for persistence, Spring, uh, a Spring Boot app for a backend written in Kotlin because Kotlin is a superior GVM language, changed my mind. And then uh, for Fronted, I used Unity, uh, which uh, is a little bit of a popular boy right now in the news with their new um, uh, pricing uh, hikes. Uh, but uh, I made this before they went all uh, suicidal. All right, so VV8 is completely open source, which is amazing. It's modular, you know, through one Docker file, I could just spin up different mod uh, embedding modules and just, you know, test things out. The documentation is actually pretty decent. And trust me, once you dig into a lot of these databases, you are, you're happy to see a little bit of a decent documentation. And the Java client is pretty decent, though it, it does lack some features you would expect from a Java client, but it's open source. So I could, you know, theoretically change it. I went, I went just to a talk that told me that, hey, you know, you need to contribute to open source, so maybe I'll do that. And, uh, but most important, importantly, you can run it completely offline, which I don't want to anger the demo gods during a presentation, so offline is, uh, you know, kind of must. And for the architecture, basically through a REST, H, uh, REST API, I'm going to be calling my backend server, and then the, client, the VV8 client library is going to call the Docker container that's running uh, which basically does REST calls and GraphQL calls. Now, some of you might see this the, and think, OK, <laughs> dude, you just can call it from Unity directly. Why do you have a backend? Well, I mean, I did say I'm a backend developer. And in my job descriptions, basically to create abstraction layers that are not necessary. So that's what I did here. <laughs> All right, so for today, we'll be using cosine distance as a distance metric. Uh, hierarchical navigable small worlds as indexing algorithm. Uh, we're going to be using a BERT model for text vectorization, a ResNet 50 model for image vectorization, and a CLIP model for same space vectorization. Again, so those models are basically our black boxes. 
So cosine distance, it has a beautiful mathematical formula. You love to see it, but in the end, this is pretty much what you care for, right? Um, if the distance is 0.0, .0 two vectors are identical. And if it's at 2.0, that means two vectors are exactly opposite to each other. So if you have a vector Java and vector C sharp, maybe the distance is 0.001, right? Because C sharp stole everything for Java. Or so they say, uh, allegedly. And um, if you have Java and JavaScript, it's going to be like 2.5 breaking all limits because, I mean, <laughs> but that's basically what we're at. Uh, and then for indexing, we're going to be using hierarchical navigable small worlds, which is a little bit trickier to uh, explain. So I tried to do it as good as I could. Uh, all right, so hierarchical navigable small worlds. Uh, this is are basically all the vectors that we want to be vectorizing or putting in our database, all the objects. So what it does is every time you put an object in a database, a vector, uh, it's gonna, the vector uh, in the database is going to run a radius check and find all the vectors uh, close to it uh, and connect itself to an x amount of uh, vectors. Uh, and the x, of course, hey, you can change it however you want. It can be 3, it can be 10. In our case, it's 3. So every single vector, every time you add a vector in your database, this is what happens if you use hierarchical navigable small worlds as an index. Funny story, though. First, this looked like a pentagram, and I don't know why, and I had to ch delete things in the database to make it look, you know, presentable. <laughs> so eventually, um, there's like a 30%, 40% chance that when something is inserted in the database, it's going to be duplicated in a second layer. And then uh, for every new object in that layer, or a duplicated layer, it's going to do the same. It's going to run a scan, scan and connect all the objects, as you can see here. And then uh, finally, in our case, we have three layers, so there's going to be even a, a third layer where things are duplicated to, which is, has even lower chance to be duplicated. So basically, we have a multi-layered graph, if uh, people are uh, fans of graphs. And then if we do a search, for example, this is somebody uh, searches for, for a vector, which would land pretty much there. And this is uh, basically the object that we're searching for. Uh, what's going to happen then, it's going to start from an entry point all the way to the top, as you can see, uh, over here, this. So it started there, and it went there. So on the top graph, it's going to search the closest node or the closest vector to your search. And then it's going to use that vector in the lower graph to find, uh, and then to continue the search. And then it's going to again find the closest node in the in the following graph, and then again, and like this, it's it's able to very quickly traverse extremely complicated node graphs. Um, I'm I'm talking about millions and millions of vector objects to give you a response within milliseconds of the vector you're searching for. So if we now add all the remaining vectors in our data set, connect them to each other, so each vector is connected to three other uh, vectors, basically, so you're creating a graph, and then you're doing a search, which is here somewhere, there we go, beautiful. And then again, you can see the search goes from there, and then goes one layer deeper, and then again, we'll go one layer deeper to eventually find the object that you're searching for. And when I read the paper about this, I was like, why didn't I think of this? I was like, it's so beautiful. So uh, let's on to our first search. Uh, anybody know where, what, anybody an idea where this is from? <laughs> Ain't that true? All right, so guns, lots of guns. Neo said it in the Matrix, he needed guns, lots of guns. He also said it in John Wick, by the way. Not a lot of you knew that, huh? Uh, so we have a little uh, data set of weapons. Uh, where each weapon has three properties, name, type, range. Let's say Excalibur, sword, short. And then when that is vectorized, it basically becomes weapon, Excalibur, short, sword, all to lowercase. Uh, the property names are removed, but you can choose to vectorize the property names as well, if you want. Um, and then, using a BERT model, uh, we get a vector rep representation of that. Okay, 
So let's quickly take a look at our data set. Uh, here we go. So these are basically all kinds of weapons uh, that I put in database. Very small data set, just you know, to test the waters and uh, see what's uh, possible. Uh, all right. So, bam. I'm, I know some of you might be confused that I'm so showing the same GIF twice, but know this I made myself. Uh, so yeah, we have Trinity asking, hey, are you crazy? And then he's like, no, I'm not crazy, I can do this. And then uh, we can search for weapons to uh, try and save Morpheus. Okay, so what weapon do we want to... Anybody any idea? Gatling gun. A Gatling gun, Jesus. A Gatling gun. Oh wait, we can say it. I want a Gatling gun. Let's see what we get. This is untested waters. It's a lily putt. <laughs> With the texture missing even, what? <laughs> All right, so if we say, for example, hey, uh, something explosive, maybe? Something explosive, there we go. Good enough. And that is the beauty of a uh, vector database. You can make typos and you don't care. So an RPG is something explosive, I would argue, right? A bazooka or a, uh, hey, uh, I want something sharp, a knife. I mean, think about it. Neo going to the lobby with a knife and winning, that would be pretty amazing. So as you can see, it's not perfect, right? So you, we had a, a miss with a Gatling gun. Uh, if we say something, uh, something that shoots bullets, uh, you get a bazooka, which it does shoot a big bullet, but not necessarily what you're searching for. Um, so what's happening here? So because our data set is so small, so few words, it's very tricky to vectorize it correctly. And then you do a search with a lot of words. So basically your, the vector database is, is getting a little bit, uh, let's say, uh, confused about what, you, what you're searching. But uh, you could very easily you know, uh, improve on that. And that is what we're going to do. Oh, and by the way, the bird model has 384 dimensions. Just imagine I said that before the demo. Thank you. All right. So, anybody that plays Dungeons or Dragons here? Cool. Anybody that play the new Baldur's Gate? Pretty cool game, right? Um, so we have a wizard that is ambushed. A wizard in Dungeons and Dragons. There are a lot of spells in Dungeons and Dragons. So I, I found data sets on Kaggle.com, amazing website. You can find open source data sets. And in that data set uh, has all the spells, D&D spells in the, uh, in the player's handbook, in the base uh, book for Dungeons and & Dragons. Um, and we're going to use that data set to help this forget, uh, forgetful wizard to cast spells to defeat you know, uh, the thugs. So we're going to have a wizard that's going to be walking around. Then, oh no, there's a thug. And then we know, we're going to help him find a spell that he can cast to defeat uh, the thug. And again, we're going to be using a BERT model for this. So if you look at the data set, this one is a little bit more complicated. So there is a lot of text here. So here you can see, hey, Acid Splash is usable by Artificer, Sorcerer Wizard, con uh, Conjuration, One Action, Instantaneous, and then a Description. Uh, if you use that as is, you will get a lot of junk out. So what I did here is basically I created a uh, a prettified description of all those properties. So, hey, um, this spell can be casted by, well, the classes, the level is this, the magic school is that, uh, this is the casting time, this is the range, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, this material cost. So basically you create a little paragraph that is very well uh, vectorizable or embeddable um, to, be, uh, to be inserted in your database. And then when we create the schema for the spells, uh, we can tell Viviate, and you can, by the way, you can tell this to every single vector database. They, I, I started working with different per demo, but then an, and I realized, okay, they all basically do the same, and they all say they're the fastest, and they all say they're the best, and in the end, they're all kind of the same. Um, so you can say, hey, I want you to um, create a property, uh, and then I want you to skip these properties. Do not vectorize these properties. Um, and for all the properties, I don't want to be, I don't want to have the property name vectorized. I just want the name and the description vectorized. So what you're going to get is the class name, magic spell, and then 
the name, let's say Fireball, and then description of Fireball. I'm not going to name the description of Fireball, but boom. So, and then if we look at what we get eventually, all right. All right, so he walked. Oh no, it looks better than Baldur's Gate 3, right? <laughs> I see, I hear laughs, and no, I see no one say yes. That's painful. All right, uh, anyone that knows the spell in Dungeons and Dragons? Lightning bolt. lightning bolt with typos and everything. Chain lightning, guiding bolt, and Eldritch blast. Not entirely what we're searching for, but quite close. <laughs> and then you can cast it, and then he goes. Poof, thug dead. <laughs> and then if we go fireball, for example, fireball, there it is. But it's not the first hit, actually. Pyrotechnics is the first hit, and fireball is the second hit. So you can see uh, we have a lot of text that's being vectorized, and we're doing searches with not a lot of text. So that is a little bit of mismatch there. So we can maybe, uh, oh, wait, let's cast it, you know. Got to keep killing the thug. There we go. So uh, I want something that shoots fire. That we get pyrotechnics, investor of flame, and produce flame. All pretty oh, fitting spells, you would say. And again, boom. <laughs> All right, sorry. All right. Um, and we, uh, we can do this better, we'll, uh, a little bit uh, for the future, to keep you guys hooked. I heard that's a good idea. All right, so before we go there, first thing, Pokemon photography. Has anybody, and I called it photography and not another name because of Nintendo, the, has anybody uh, know, uh, played this game back in the well, 90s, I think, early 2000s? Pokemon Snap. You, you are on rails, you go around and you take pictures of Pokemon. No, but everybody that tell, uh, that, that's all, who likes that? Well, a lot of people like that, it's insane. Uh, I'm not affiliated by Nintendo, by the way, please don't sue me. Um, so, what we're gonna do is try to recreate Pokemon Snap using image vectorizers. So, we have Ash that goes towards a Pokemon, flips his hat, because that's what Ash does, and then takes a picture, and using a ResNet 50 model, Hopefully, we can find the Pokemon that we're searching for. All right. So first things first, let me show you how our data looks like. Uh, so we have a lot of Pokemon. Let's say we have Bulbasaur. We have... Which, which is this Pokemon? <laughs> Charmeleon, right? Yeah, there we go. And this, uh, this one? <laughs> You didn't expect to be uh, asked which Pokemon is which during this talk, did you? <laughs> what, what is it in French? Yeah, I cannot pronounce that, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, which one is this? Pikachu. Okay, everybody knows Pikachu, right? <laughs> uh, and I have all the Pokemon in here, and I have an Excel sheet telling me which Pokemon is which. And so I basically put them all in the database. It took like three minutes to put like, uh, 200 or 700 images in the database, so that's actually quite slow. Um, so here, vector databases are slow at insert time, so please do not insert things continuously in production. Um, and then once we're gonna try and cache them all, all right. All right, so this is Ash, as you can obviously see, right? Uh, and this is a Pikachu, and then we take a look at Pikachu, very cute. We take a picture, and it is a beauty fly. That is not correct, right? <laughs> Don't worry, this is supposed to happen. <laughs> so we take uh, we go like this, and then like this. And that now it's Pikachu. Now that's weird, right? So what's happening here? Anybody got an, an idea? Uh, it's a bit tricky. So we, does anybody know what this Pokemon is? Beedrill, yes. If we take a picture, it's a print plop. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a Beedrill. So underwater, what I'm doing is basically I'm taking a, a screen cap of what the camera sees. Uh, I vectorize it, so, uh, put it in the database, or send to the database and tell me, okay, find something that is close to this. And if you look at the, if you look 
here at our logs, you can see, hey, uh, there is a result with a distance of 0 0.16, there's a distance of 0 0.25, 0 0.31, so they all are pretty close to each other. So what's happening here? First things first, the, uh, the model, the embedding uh, module, uh, does not understand transparency. So uh, all uh, transparent pixels are translated into white or black. So here I made them all white. And the module does not understand Pokemon to my, you know, shock. So to, to make this work, you should actually kind of, you know, train your own vectorizing, uh, vectorization module, embedding module to understand Pokemon, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's a lot of work. But what you could also do is uh, use pictures from different angles, for example. So now I have one angle per Pokemon with a white background, uh, which is impossible to find. So because if I go, for example, over here, uh, where is the little bugger hiding? Here. Which one is this? Mew. And we take a picture. No, it is Joltik. <laughs> now, the, why is why and the the people that are very ob observant have seen that yellow Pokemon somehow get favored over uh, non-yellow Pokemon. Now, that has a reason. Uh, because I kind of wanted you to at least wanted to at least find Pikachu. <laughs> uh, if you look at the camera that takes the image, the background is yellow. <laughs> so uh, what I did here is basically uh, because the embedding module basically defaults to a color when it doesn't really understand the context of the image. Uh, I was like, hey. Pikachu is pretty yellow, so I made the background yellow, and like that, it was quite easy to find Pikachu once I took the picture. But again, um, this shows that vector databases are not like a magic solution. Okay, hoop, spin them up, throw in our data, however it is, it will figure it out. No, they really, it, they really need some work to, you know, uh, populate them with the correct data, uh, searchable data uh, that, uh, you know, uh, gives back the result you want, um, well, somehow, predict predictably. Um, all right, then we can go to our wizard again, which is ambushed again. He has a little bit of, you know, memory loss. Uh, walk back to the same path and it's like, okay, uh, here's this thug again. But this time we're going to do something different. This time we're going to try to make it a little, bit, a little bit more gamey, so to say. So, uh, oh, the thug appears, very important. And then he's going to, okay, I'm going to cast a spell. Um, we're going to, again, use a BERT model to find spells from our database, but then we're going to get the name of our spell. Uh, so, for example, Fireball or Lightning Bolt or uh, Frost Fingers, and then we're going to uh, use it to uh, find an icon that matches that name of the spell. So we're trying to automate the, the spell, the finding a spell and showing an icon at the same time. Now, thankfully, 20-year-old Alex, me, uh, saw a Humble Bundle, well, 13 years ago now, and I was like, that's cool, I'll buy that with all kinds of game icons in it. And who, who would have thought that it would actually come to use here today? So these are, this is a data set of icons uh, that you, know, uh, you can use in RPG games, uh, like what we're making now, uh, which is Baden the Baldur's Gate 3. Thank you very much. So, as you can see, these icons are actually pretty good. Um, and they're pretty high res. Um, and they don't have transparent pixels, which is very important, because uh, the module doesn't handle transparency very well. Uh, so, uh, we basically put all these, uh, what are they? Uh, 213 icons in the database, took four minutes to vectorize them and insert them in the database. So, uh, if you're used to relational databases, I mean, those are, are astronomical numbers, right? Four minutes to insert uh, 200 items, that's a lot. Uh, and then we're going to query them using the name of the spells that we find. All right, so. Uh, where are we? Here we are. Okay, so we're back. Uh, let's, try, let's try Lightning Bolt again, I guess. Let's see if I can type it correctly this time. <laughs> Lightning bolt. Hey, there it is. And those are the icons that are immediately found uh, 
uh, through using the name of the uh, spell and you know querying the database again. So this is like a two-step query that we do here. So I mean, I don't know about you guys, but that does look like a, not a lightning bolt, right? Anybody disagrees? <laughs> Great. Uh, and the lightning arrow, not very lightning-y, but very arrow-y. So that is also good. <laughs> um, a chain lightning? I mean, you can't argue there's a chain there. <laughs> so uh, if we, then if we cast a lightning bolt, we, got, we get a little pyrotechnics explosion. And he flew up very high. Uh, let's uh, try something else, because now we are searching for, you know, a search term uh, that's not really semantic search. How about uh, some uh, a spell that uh, is uh, shoots frost from my fingers? Frost fingers. Whoa, that's in there. I had no idea. <laughs> and then we cast frost fingers. Bam. Now, again, people that are very observant might have seen that this was a different particle effect. <laughs> yes. So if we have, uh, if, if, I mean, if you give uh, game developers, people that like to work with games, colors, uh, they can do some cool stuff. So what I did is I extract the average color from the icon I find, and then I have per color, uh, or you know, uh, not every color in the spectrum, <laughs> uh, per big color like blue, green, yellow, I have a particle effect that matches that uh, color. So like that, you can even get a little effect that matches, you know, the color, uh, the icon. Uh, so let's try something. Oh, I have an explosion quota. Every time I give a presentation, I say, OK, I got to show you guys one explosion at least. Uh, I want a fireball. There it is, the fireball. And if we cast it, oh, <sighs> that's the explosion without the impact. <laughs> so let's go again. Uh, uh, fireball. And again, bam. And that is my explosion quota reached. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it goes much further. Any other, any other spells? Anybody? Gust of wind. Okay. Gust of wind. Something windy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we find it. Warding wind, wind wall. Wind wall is good, I hear. Let's go. Bam. So when it's all colors, basically can, it finds an average color that's very close to black. So then I just show all colors. Uh, let's see. Uh, how about gust of wind? Control winds. Gust of wind. There it is. Very bluish. But those are spider webs. But I can see, understand why it would think it was you know, a gust. So there we go. Bam! Oh, that was blue, electric. Very cool. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, let's not continue every, but uh, how about uh, contagion? It's pretty cool. And then, ooh, flock of familiars. Huh? That's every time Sima kind of mesmerized by oh, lightning purple, huh? uh, by uh, the icons that are actually found in there. It's, it's really cool. Uh, and then, how about, how about wish? And people that play D&D know. This is a broken spell. Oh no! Ah! I forgot to spawn him back. It is what it is. All right. So, because we don't have a lot of time left, and I also want to kind of take questions from you guys. Um, so, with this, you can kind of, you know, put images and text in the same vector space, and you can query them both. You can query text using images or images using text, vice versa. And it's very cool. You can do a lot of cool things with this. Um, do you, who likes coffee? Oh, 50, 60 percent. Uh, does anybody recognize these images? One person? What is it? Is, it is an Adult Swim cartoon. I don't know the name. It is Metalocalypse. Yes. Exactly. It's the greatest band in the world, Death Clock. I'm a little bit of a metalhead myself. Any other metalheads here? 
a couple, hmm, less than I hoped, people that absolutely hate metal music. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I gotta show this. <laughs> All right, so um, what we're gonna do here, um, every time I listen to metal music and there, you know, the grunting starts, the good part starts, and you're like, okay, what are they saying here? So, you know, like I put it through transcribers and they're like, okay, can you tell me what's happening here? So what we're gonna try here is actually put, uh, so I have an uh, AI transcriber embedded in Unity. We're gonna load in the song, which is Duncan Hill's Coffee Jingle by Death Clock. Important to remember, it is the international anthem for coffee, uh, you know. Um, it's gonna be transcribed on the spot. Um, uh, there is some heavy grunting, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, on the right side, actual lyrics, those are the lyrics of the song. On the left side is what the AI thinks uh, the lyrics are. I have a data set of like 700 songs, uh, maybe even more. Uh, so these are the songs. I have Beyonce in here, Billie Eilish, Coldplay, Ed Sheeran, Post Malone, Taylor Swift, and Metal. Very important. And this is the song we're, this is the object we are searching for. So every second or so, we're gonna query our database with the transcribed li lyrics that we have found to see if we can find this particular song. Place your bets now, I would say. All right, so let's hope the sound works, and let's hope I don't uh, deafen anybody here. All right, so it's transcribing. There we go. Drink the folks like coffee. Close, Beyonce, doubt it. coffee from the hills of Colombia. Lady Gaga no, from the hills? What? From a dozen Common Death, Cold Play, Closer, Closer, A Nightmare, A Wargun, well, metal, but not what we're searching for. Sailor Swift, what? Taylor, Selena Gomez, yes, for sure. Prepare for ultimate favors, to you the world shall be free of. Of? <laughs> Post Malone, uh, a bit heavy. Then we go to the, you know, necessary uh, guitar solo. We're, we're, you, you. Definitely what we're saying right now. Did anybody put his money on easily found? <laughs> so... With this, one thing is sure, people, when Skynet emerges and the, uh, the AI uh, revolution happens, all we need to do is just grunt to each other and then we have no idea what we're talking about and then we can beat them easily. So that, that was my time. Thank you very much for watching. I hope, I hope you learned something. I hope you can use it in your daily work. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, see you later. And I have uh, some time for a couple of questions. If people have questions. Yes? Um, were you able to like, adjust any bit of the factorization? Like, uh, clearly the model is having some issues. How would you adjust that? So if, I, if you can adjust the uh, vectorization. Um, the thing is, the module we use uh, is one of the most popular ones. Uh, used, uh, you can find in a hugging face, uh, uh, trained by OpenAI. So, but that thing is kind of trained on, you know, wiki pa uh, Wikipedia pages, stuff like that. And especially when you do things like, okay, give me Pokemon, then it's going to have a little bit of trouble. So, uh, to actually adjust it, then you really need to have your own neural network and start training it, which is not impossible. You can even uh, query, um, you can use OpenAI to train your own models, or even Azure has uh, services for you to train your own models, which is definitely possible, but, you know, uh, I didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, so you put images in the same vector space as the text? Yes. Did you have labels for the images and that's how you put it? Or no. So the images do not have any kind of labels. I just put them in as they were. 
and the, vector, uh, the vectorization module understood, okay, this is definitely fire, or this is definitely wind, this is definitely uh, you know, a spider web, or so, something like that. And then when you search for something with, co that contains fire, it's going to match each other. So uh, it's going to be very close to each other. So no labeling or whatsoever needed. So pretty cool. Yeah. All right, that was my time. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, well, I'll see you later. <laughs>